good evening everybody uh, we have we are at the uh, second uh, knowledge sharing session today uh, today our resource person is uh, we know everyone of you know about him dr neil fernando senior consultant psychiatrist and a senior lecturer at general sir john uh, uh, kotalavala defense university so uh, this will be the first session of this ethics and legal aspects in mental health so there will be another session maybe in the in in some time later uh, so i invite uh, dr neil fernando to start his session okay thank you and uh, good evening to everyone uh, can you hear me yes sir we can hear you can you yeah right okay so first of all thank you for inviting me to share some ideas about this very interesting uh, topic uh, medical legal aspects in mental health as uh, pradeep said uh, it's a very vast area so i will not be able to cover the whole area in a space of 1 hour so i have selected uh, some i thought which is which will be interesting uh, topics uh, concerning medical legal aspects in mental health uh, but there are some other important topics that probably we might be able to cover in another session in the future so as i understand i have about 1 hour uh, to make my presentation and of course after that uh there is a time period allocated for discussion so i have actually used the word ethics also into this uh, topic uh, because uh, medical legal aspects are directly related to the ethics as well so it is very important that we should understanding some basic uh, things about ethics as well when we talk about uh, medical legal aspects in mental health especially for practicing uh, mental health professionals uh, this aspect is very important so i will first uh, start with the ethical aspects um, so to begin with uh, the ethical aspects in mental health care is based on three principles three ethical principles and they are described as one the first one is beneficence i will explain this to you uh, beneficence respect for autonomy and justice so three important principles so ethical principle so ethics is based on these three principles beneficence respect for autonomy and justice now what what we understand by beneficence beneficence means two things one is doing what is best for the patient patient or client you can name it anyway doing what is best in other words you have to always act in the best interest of the patient or the client best interest of the patient or the client that is number 1 and number 2 is you must also ensure that you do no harm do no harm so your intervention should not do any harm or your interaction with the patient or the client should not do any harm so this is also called non malevolence that's another name given in simple terms ensure that you don't do any harm both are included in the principle called beneficence so the first thing is to do what is best for the patient act in the best interest of the patient and secondly also ensure that you don't do any harm to the patient so these are that is what is meant by beneficence 
coming on to the second one, the second principle, respect for autonomy. Now, autonomy of the patient. Now, here, this is very important because when we become a therapist, you may be a doctor, you may be a psychologist, you may be a counselor, you may be a psychotherapist. We will, I will call all of them as therapist, right? When we assume the role of a therapist, we, as a result of being a therapist, we gain some authority, right? We have some authority. All therapists have an authority. So because of the authority, uh, sometimes we may Sometimes, using that authority, we may sometimes disrespect the patient. Sometimes without our knowledge. So, in order to prevent that, it is very important that in whatever our therapy, to involve the patient in the therapy. Involving patients or clients in the therapy. Now, that the word given for that is collaboration. So, you have to collaborate with your client or patient. Now, why is collaboration important? Collaboration means, another term to explain collaboration is to make the patient or the client also a partner of the treatment, partner of the therapy. So what is the role of a partner? Partner, partnership is ownership. So in other words, the patient or the client should also be the owner of the therapy. So in order to make the person a partner, uh, you have to collaborate with the patient or the client. Now, Why do we need to collaborate with the patient? Because we have to accept that patient himself, patient or the client himself is an expert of their illness or symptom or their problem. We are experts in the therapy. Patient or the client is the expert in their illness or their problem or whatever. So, both have some expertise and both expertise should be used in the therapy. And that is what is meant by real autonomy. Now, in order to involve the patient in the therapy, the patient has to be involved in four areas of the therapy. The four areas are Firstly, the planning of the therapy. So when the therapy is planned, get ideas and views and concurrence of the patient or the client as much as possible. He or she should be involved in the planning of the therapy. So any therapy has to be planned and the planning should involve the input from the patient or the client. Once the plan is completed, then you have to implement the plan, that is to carry out the plan and the patient or the therapist should be involved, the patient should be involved in the implementing of the plan also. Now, most of the time, Patients carry out their treatment on their own. So, they are anyway involved. So, getting them involved in the implementing of the plan. That's the second thing. Thirdly, you need to involve them in the monitoring of the therapy. Monitoring means to ensure that the plans are implemented in the correct way. That is called monitoring. To see 
whether the plans are being implemented in the correct way. So that is called monitoring. So involving the patient or the clients in the monitoring aspect as well. Now, for example, I will give an example. Say, treating a diabetic patient, right? Just to give an example, a medical example. Um, in the planning, you have to discuss the options available, whether it is only a diet regulated therapy or whether it is diet plus any anti-diabetic uh, medication involved to reduce the blood sugar, whether it is just oral medication or whether in addition to oral medication, whether you also need to inject insulin, all these are decided in the planning. And usually the plan is carried out by the patient or the client. So taking the tablets, if it is the tablets, taking it in the correct way or injecting the insulin in the correct amount. Now all this can be done by the patient. So that is the implementing part and carrying out the diet restrictions accordingly. The monitoring part will be the the patient or the client can monitor the progress. With a glucometer, the patient can monitor from home whether the blood sugar level is coming down or whether it is going up. So the monitoring part. Then comes the evaluation. Evaluation is actually looking at the overall aims and goals, whether we have achieved what we initially wanted to achieve. And there should be indicators and that will indicate whether the therapy has gone according to the plan and the aims. So in all four areas, as far as possible, a patient needs to be involved. If you can involve them in all these four areas, then the patient is an active participant of the therapy. So that is the patient has collaborated and that ensures the autonomy of the patient. So that is the respect of autonomy that we understand by this principle. Then thirdly, the principle of justice. That is, it includes four things. First thing is acting fairly. You have to act fairly by the patient or the client. Right, fairness will include if you don't have the expertise to treat the condition or if there is a better person to treat the condition, sending the person or the patient or the client to that person. That is also acting fairly by the patient in the best interest. Now, for example, Sometimes patients are brought to me for consultation and I find out that the patient or patient is a child. Patient is a child. I can treat the child. There is no, there is no barrier in for me to treat the child. But from a, the child's point of view, it is better for the child to be treated by a child and an adolescent psychiatrist who are specialized in that field. So when there are specialists available in an area where the expertise would be better, acting fairly means actually rather than you trying to treat the person, 
you would refer the person to a person who is more uh, expert than you to treat that person. So that is also part of acting fairly, right? So it's up to the person who is uh, practicing to show that fairness. The big pay for the patient, the patient, our most of our patients, our clients are innocent patients. They may not know who is the best person to go. So sometimes they come because of hearsay. Someone has given an opinion to see, see me and they come to me. But it's my my duty to actually point out that there are more better experts than me to deal with that particular issue and to refer them to them. So that is also part of fairness. So acting fairly, very important. That is justice by the patient in the best interest of the patient. Then of course, no discrimination. Justice also will include no discrimination. So you can't make any discrimination. Discrimination means treating differently. There should not be absolutely no discrimination. But it can be in discrimination in the in the race, caste, religion, whatever. Hmm? So all patients so all clients should be treated in an equal manner hmm? to the best of your ability, to the best of your ability, without any discrimination. Right. So for example, because a patient is a private patient of you. Now these things can happen. I may admit a patient to the ward. Uh, that patient had channeled me and I have admitted that patient to the ward. And if I give special preference to that patient in the ward, where there are other patients who have not channeled me, but they are also under me, then I am not treating everyone in the, in the same way. I am discriminating the patients who have not channeled me. I mean, these things can happen. So it is very important to ensure that there is no discrimination whatsoever. Then third one is showing respect. Justice will include showing respect to the patient. Now again, an important point Showing respect will include many things, especially showing respect by um, um, respecting their beliefs and practices also. Now, a lot of patients who come to us also have beliefs and practices about their condition. And before coming to us, they may indulge in those beliefs and practices. For example, they may indulge in various traditional things that they believe, right? Though you may not agree with all that, still you need to respect They are beliefs and practices. Now, I worked with one consultant when I was a junior medical officer in psychiatry. Uh, in fact, he was my first consultant. He was a good clinician, but he had this weakness. When a patient comes to him with all these uh, strings around his neck, due to various rituals that have taken place before coming, the first thing that he does is, without even asking, talking to the patient, the first thing that he does is, he cuts all those strings. He has a scissor kept in the, in the ta on the table. And the first thing that he does is, he always cuts the strings and throws the strings uh, into the waste paper basket. And then only he will begin to interview. Now, that I think is showing disrespect to the patient in the form of disrespecting the patient's beliefs and practices. 
on the one hand, it, you have no right to do that. On the other hand, you are also openly displaying your disrespect. So you have to be careful. Patients, especially patients coming with various uh, beliefs and practices. Sometimes, sometimes those beliefs and practices may be harmful to the patient or the client. So when you realize that there is some harm happening as a result of those uh, beliefs and practices, then you can point out that. You can explain it to the patient, but it is ultimately the patient who has to decide. Right? You should not impose your views on the patient. That's very important. So that is also important when you are showing. So that is also part of showing respect. Then of course, uh, uphold the dignity of the patient. All patients are humans and you need to uphold the human dignity. Mm -hmm. And especially when it comes to mental health issues, patients have additional problems like the stigma associated with it. So uh, you have to also show the respect. So the dignity of the patient, showing respect, and especially when the patient or the client belongs to a um, culture different from your culture. Showing dignity. If the patient is an elderly patient, elderly than you, in our culture, there are ways of treating elderly people. If the patient or the client is a priest, you need to show the respect that the patient uh, has. So these are all things that you need to be aware of. And these all come under this principle called justice, right? Now, what is the guideline available for doctors, the medical officers, doctors, and also the psychologists, clinical psychologists who are registered in the Sri Lanka Medical Council? Uh, they are governed by the codes and practices, codes and codes and practice guidelines prepared by the Sri Lanka Medical Council. And these guidelines are prepared on two, uh, uh, on the basis of two things. It is evidence-based practice as well as value-based practice. So we all have to, and we are governed by this uh, Sri Lanka Medical Council guidelines. So from time to time, they they renew these guidelines, so we need to be updated on the guidelines, especially if you are registered under the Sri Lanka Medical Council. So I believe all the doctors and all the clinical psychologists have to be registered uh, under the Sri Lanka Medical Council. There are others also who are registered. So, but even if you are not registered, say there may be counselors, who are not registered under the Sri Lanka Medical Council, but these guidelines are useful. These are generally universal guidelines. Um, counselors may have their own code of ethics, and uh, so you can adhere to that because the guidelines are generally universal and uh, they are usually evidence-based and value-based. Right. Now we will look at some problems that you will encounter in psychiatric or mental health practice. So I have just uh, decided to talk about uh, five areas, client counselor relationships, issues, problems about confidentiality, problems about consent, problems about compulsory treatment and are for research. So these are some five very fun, five important areas uh, where uh, there can be problems and you must know how to, uh, what is the baseline or how to approach these 
uh, areas. So we will uh, next discuss about those uh, problem areas. Um, first, uh, coming on to the client counselor relationship. Now, as all of you know, this relationship is called client counselor or client therapist or patient doctor or whatever. The relationship is built on trust. And also the client's interest should be the first priority. And also it should be based on ethical principles, which we have discussed. So that is easy to understand. Now, what about the problems? Abuse of the relationship. So these are some of the common abuses that might take place. Imposing your own values and beliefs on the client. Trying to impose because your authority, because your authority as a therapist, sometimes you may force your values and beliefs upon the patient, which is again not correct. Right? Of course, you can discuss pros and cons of certain practices and things like that, but it is up to the patient or the client to decide. Then second area is putting the interest of a third party before those of the clients. Now, sometimes this is this can happen. Third parties can try to influence you. It may be the third party that is bringing the patient to you or the client to you. So you have to be careful because your contract is with the client or the patient and you have to act in the best interest of the patient and the client, not in the interest of the third parties. Then thirdly, abuse of relationship commonly occurs where clients or patients are exploited from a sexual point of view. Now again, that is something that you have to be careful of. You cannot have any form of sexual relationships, even with the consent of the patient. And the ethics go as far as saying that even after the therapeutic relationship is over, having any sexual relationship is again not ethical. This is to ensure that patients are not, patients or clients are not exploited. Uh, for sexual purposes. Then the next one is exploiting clients or patients for financial gain. Again, it's very important that if you are practicing uh, uh, for a fee which you are entitled you have to again ensure that you are not exploiting the patient mm -hmm. gaining uh, financial gains by exploiting the patient so again a uh, area that needs to be looked at very carefully, right? So these are the four areas which are probably frequently violated in the relationship, therapist-client relationship. Coming on to confidentiality, It is central to the trust between the client and the counselor or 
obviously. And information should not be disclosed to anyone without the explicit consent of the client. So any information that has to be shared with someone, some other party, a third party, which is sometimes essential in the therapy, uh, it has to be always with the consent of the client. Now, this confidentiality issue goes also beyond the person's life, the client's life. So, obligation to maintain even after the death of a client, the confidentiality. I can tell you, share you a story. Uh, the, uh, this, um, he was a very famous psychiatrist, Dr. D.V.J. Harishchandra, who passed away some years back. Now, he was once summoned to Gold Courts because he had seen a client, a patient, three months before that client's death. So, he, this patient had been coming to see him in the private sector and suddenly this patient died. Um, and there was an inquiry about the death and the inquiring officers have found out that this patient had been going to Dr. Harish Chandra for treatment. So, he was summoned to courts. So, when he was summoned to courts, he went to courts and standing on the witness stand, when he was asked about the details about the, the patient, he remained silent. He did not answer any questions. He remained silent. And when the judge inquired, why are you silent? Why are you not answering the questions put to you? Then he told the judge that I have taken the Hippocratic Oath when I became a doctor. And in that oath, one of the things that I have, I have to safeguard is confidentiality of a patient. And this patient, information that this patient gave me um, is confidential and I don't have her consent to divulge. And even after death, I have the obligation to safeguard that confidentiality. So he said that it was in open court and the judge actually accepted that. So that is where the obligation of confidentiality goes even beyond the life of a client. Now, what are the ethical principles about confidentiality? There are three things. Safeguarding, so as a, as a mental health professional, you have to safeguard these three things. Safeguarding information, consent to disclose information, and the confidentiality in the care of children when it comes to children. So these are three areas that um, you need to be away of. So we will look at each one of them. Safeguarding information, whatever records that you take, keep, either written records or recorded records, you have to keep them securely. It is your responsibility to uh, keep them securely. It's your duty. Uh, then Consultation should be done in privacy, which is normally the case. And also avoid discussing in public. If you have to discuss it with a supervisor or in a case presentation or in a discussion, you can do that, but always the identity of the person should be anonymous. You can discuss the problem, you can discuss the case, you can discuss the illness, but the identity of the person should be never divulged.
consent to disclose information the legally accept consent is consent to obtain what we call informed consent i will come to that in the next slide consent to be informed so it is the informed consent that is a valid consent legally valid so what is that i will discuss in the next slide then when the person is giving the consent the person who gives the consent should understand the reasons for disclosure so if you are getting the consent of a person to disclose some information the person should understand why it is necessary so you have to explain it to the person and understand the content of this what are the things that you are going to disclose that also the content of the disclosure also should be known to the person and thirdly understand the likely consequences of such a disclosure what will happen to you if this thing that so all these things uh, you have to actually explain to the person and then only obtain the consent right so a consent to be valid legally sorry i'll come to that later i'll come to that later uh, then the third area is the confidentiality in the care of children now you may be uh, caring for children now children means in sri lanka anyone below the age of 18 years so 18, 18 years is our, in sri lanka this is 18 years in other countries it can be different uh, so clinical now in in children clinical information needs to be shared with the parents or the legal guardians why because our law assumes that the children are incapable of looking after themselves so that is why parents and parents or the legal guardians have the responsibility of looking after them so they have to be informed so whatever things that are related to a child that has to be discussed with the parents or the legal guardian because they also have a responsibility to act in the best interest of the child so for that they need to know uh, the information so when it comes to children you have to share the information with the parents and the or the legal guardian if there is a problem situation and there can be problem situations the best way to act is in the best interest of the client so that is the sort of the main theme that you must have it in your mind i must always act in the best interest of the client or the patient right so problem situations may be uh, seeking information when you have to seek information from outside outside sources other than the patient now these are the problem areas so you have to be careful then disclosing information to outsiders to others then when you have to assess the patient on behalf of a third party so these are the areas that you have to be careful when you have to care the patient in the community now we have what we call community mental health service now we have community mental health nurses they go to the community so they see the patients in their own house but when you go to the house sometimes that might uh, endanger the privacy right so that is why generally these nurses community psychiatric nurses they do not go in their nursing uniform they go in a um, in a normal civil dress right that is to minimize this uh, uh, thing of uh, other people the neighbors getting to know about this right so you have to be careful right community care is important it's very valuable but also you have to be careful also then when you are conducting uh, group therapies 
right? Some of you sometimes do group therapies, therapy in a group. Now, where there are groups have to share their problems and things like that. Again, uh, this issue about uh, confidentiality might come. So these are areas where you have to solve. So you may have to, you must ensure that um, sensitive, sensitive topics, sensitive areas should not be discussed in a group therapy, right? It's very important. Then therapy with couples and families, right? So these are the problem areas that might arise. And so the best norm to follow or the standard to follow is always acting the best interest of the client. Now, there are three exceptions for confidentiality. I'll just run through it. Uh, first, in the interest, client's interest. For example, if the client is suicidal, in order to save the life of the client, you may have to sometimes uh, uh, breach confidentiality in order to save the life. Then in the public interest, if someone, someone else is, uh, is in danger, as a result of the client's behavior, that's another area where confidentiality can be breached. Thirdly, of course, for legal purposes. So these are three areas where you have to sometimes breach confidentiality. Right, coming on to the consent, which is again important area. So all treatment must be with consent. So all therapy must be with consent and only the client can give the consent. So that's important to remember. Um, now, for a consent to be legally valid, these four things have to be fulfilled. Firstly, it has to be voluntary. So no undue uh, force or undue uh, uh, influence should be done to get the consent. It has to be voluntary free and voluntary. Huh? That's very important. Now, because you are an authority, because you have some authority over the patient or the client, you might use that authority. Now, for example, a doctor can say, if you don't give the consent, uh, I will discharge you from the ward. Because I have the authority to discharge. But then, by saying that and getting the consent is not valid, because it is not a consent that is given freely, uh, voluntarily. Then informed consent. Consent, even if it is voluntary, it is not valid unless it is informed that the person is knowing what the person is consenting for. Right? All the details about it. And it is your responsibility to give those details to the client so that the client can make the decision, correct decision. And in that, you must also give what are the other alternatives available. That also must be disclosed. So that is informed consent. Then the person should also be competent to give the consent. Now, there are some patients who are not, some clients who are not competent to give the consent. I will discuss it in the next slide. So it has to be a competent person. That is, the capacity to give the consent should be there. And also, lastly, the consent has to be documented. Documented. That's very important. Now, the situation where a person will be not having the capacity to give the consent, the competent, not competent to give the consent, are uh, one is young age, if the person has a learning disability, previously called mental retardation, if the person has a mental disorder in the form of a psychotic disorder, not all mental disorders, but certainly psychotic disorders, the person may not have the capacity to give the consent. And of course, if the patient is unconscious, Right Now, these are situations where the person lacks the capacity to give the consent. Now, there 
the then the responsibility falls on the therapist to act in the best interest of the patient. Now, when explicit consent is not required, first one is called implied consent. When the patient's behavior implies that the patient is consenting for treatment, that again, you don't have to ask for the consent because the behavior implies the patient wants treatment. A good example is a patient coming to the outpatient department to a government hospital or any private hospital, coming to the outpatient department, uh, taking a number, staying in the queue, and then going for the consultation. So all that behavior indicates that the patient wants treatment. So that is called implied consent. So then you don't have to ask for consent. So that is called implied consent. Hmm? Then of course the other two are necessity and a medical emergency. Those are two situations. Again, you have to act in the best interest of the patient. Now, this is something that is not in Sri Lanka. Uh, in other countries, especially in UK and USA, there is this thing called consent in advance. Now, this is not available in Sri Lanka at the moment, but we need to go to that these areas because these are the advanced development in this area uh, is called consent given in advance. Well, there are two things. One is advanced statement, which is not legally binding, but the, the patient or the client can tell the therapist certain preferences in advance, which the therapist uh, might adhere to as a respect to the person. So that is called an advanced statement. Then a more legally, that is not legally binding, but a more legally binding one is called the advanced decision to refuse treatment, right? So the person can make a statement refusing certain treatment, forms of treatment. Uh, and that can be done in a formal way. And that is legally binding. So you need to respect that. So these are things that are not available in Sri Lanka at the moment. Right. Uh, coming on to research, ethics in doing research. Most of you are engaged in research and uh, it is important to follow ethical guidelines in research as well because it also has a medical legal uh, aspect. So the research, the principles of ethic, ethical research is one is it has to be, the research has to be based on scientific merits, scientifically accepted method. Then safety of the patients or the clients consent of the participants and of course the confidentiality. Those are the four areas. So when you get the consent from a participant for a research, these are the areas that we need to be uh, mindful of. That the participant should be aware that the research will not benefit them personally, free from any form of inducement in order for the person to take part in the research. Person having the right to withdraw from the research at any given time without giving any reasons. It is good to have a family member to monitor the person, participant, right from the beginning to the end of the research. So there is always a family member also looking after the well-being of the person. And of course, in what we call this placebo control trials, now drug trials and various placebo control trials, the person should understand the probability of receiving a placebo instead of the treatment. 
So these are some areas that you need to be aware of when you are planning research and getting the consent of participants for research. Now that is why you have to submit a protocol to the ethical committee for ethical clearance and they will look into these areas before giving their ethical clearance. And sometimes you may have to involve patients who are unable to give consent. The patient is so ill or incapacitated, they are unable to give consent, but research becomes important in them also. So the guidelines are very clear. Any potential benefit of the research on, to the person, any possible discomfort or risk to the person, these are the things that you need to take into consideration. Uh, the potential benefit to others with similar problems and any signs or indications that suggest unspoken objection. Sometimes the person may show some pain or some discomfort while undergoing some procedure in the research. In that case, you need to be careful and ensure that the patient is not made in not to undergo discomfort, additional discomfort as a result of your study. So these are some of the areas that you have to be careful when you are involving subjects who are unable to give the consent, but still the research is important to, for future uh, development of the, the, the science or the subject. Right. I have a few more minutes. Uh, uh, available. Uh, Pradeep, how many minutes available? Uh, we started a bit late. Yes, uh, you can have maybe we can go up to 7.10 maybe so we can have another ah, no. 20 minutes. Yeah, questions. I yeah. will not need that amount. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I may need a few minutes after 7 probably. Right. So just a few things about compulsory treatment. Now, now, compulsory treatment is only possible for patients with a mental problem, mental health problem. All other problems, the treatment has to be with consent. It is only for certain mental illnesses where compulsory treatment is, uh, is possible. And in Sri Lanka, we have a mental health ordinance governing this uh, form of treatment. Uh, so, to in order to qualify for compulsory treatment, the person should be suffering from a mental disorder, which actually removes his capacity, and which removes his, which makes him incapacity, makes him incapable of giving consent because of his illness, for example, a psychotic illness, right? And sometimes treatment, compulsory treatment invariably needs keeping the patient in a hospital. So that may be because for the safety of the patient, the patient can be acutely suicidal or might harm himself because of the disturbed behavior or may harm other people. So in order to safeguard his life as well as the life of others, you may have to treat the patient without the patient consent. So compulsory treatment is only used when the person refuses voluntary treatment. If the person agrees for voluntary treatment, then that can be used. And also appropriate treatment should be available for that particular condition. So these are some of the guidelines that are used when we decide about compulsory treatment. Right. Finally, a few words about medical negligence. Now, medical negligence will include not only negligence by doctors, this will also include negligence by nurses as well as 
uh, therapist, right? So I think as a counselor or as a therapist, we all need to know about this medical negligence. Um, now, the best case to study about medical negligence is the case of Professor Priyani Soisa. She was a professor of pediatrics and the case is Arsakula Ratna versus Priyani Soisa. Some of you may know, some of you may not know. And now, the case is where uh, Professor Priyani Soisa uh, saw a patient, a child. She was a professor of pediatrics. So this, uh, this child was brought to the patient, uh, to Professor Priyani Soisa uh, with a limp. Uh, that was the presentation. And, and of course, the child was then admitted and uh, um, treated, but the condition progressively worsened and ultimately the child was taken to England by the parents um, where they found a brain tumor in the child and the child actually died as a result of the tumor, uh, which was diagnosed in London uh, and the patient died. Uh, it was an inoperable tumor, so they could not do anything. Now, after the death, a case was filed against the professor by the parents uh, claiming damage, claiming medical negligence. So this is a landmark case. So what we should know about is there are four Ds that are important in deciding medical negligence. And that is something that we all as therapists should remember because these are the four things that will determine whether a negligence has taken place. The first thing is, so four Ds, all starting with the letter D. Duty, deviation, damage and direct. Those are the T, four words. Huh? Now what, what we mean by that, I will go one by one. <clears throat> so the first D is the duty. That is the contract with the patient. So whenever you see a client, invariably you, be, you come into a contract with the patient. So the, the, if someone is claiming medical negligence against a therapist, the first thing that he has to prove to the courts is that he or his patient had a contract with you. Now, in this case, the patient was brought to Dr. Priya, Professor Priyani Soisa and Priyani Soisa admitted the patient to her ward. So that was the contract. So the pay, Professor Priyani Soisa had a contract with the child, right? So that's the first thing. You must have a contract, right? If you have not seen a patient, then you cannot be... Uh, charge for medical ninja. For example, if you had been on leave, approved leave, and during that time someone else has looked after the patient, then you, you, are, not, you are not responsible for that because you have, don't have a duty of contract at that time. Second D is also, they must also prove that the treatment that was given was deviant from the expected stand of tree, standard of treatment. So there should be a deviation from the expected standard, standard of treatment. Expected standard of treatment. So that again depends on two things, on the person as well as on the institution, because the standards of treatment can be different in different institutions. For example, in a rural small hospital, the standard of care and a standard of care in a teaching hospital is quite different. So it depends on in which institution you had treated. Then also it is different from the person. 
standard of care from in a, a junior medical officer or an intern officer expected and a standard of care from a professor in the field of pediatrics or in that field is quite different. So that is something that will be looked at. Has, the, has there been a deviation or a change in the standard of care that was given to the person? So that's the second D that has to be proved. The third D is of course there must be damage. Even if the standard of care is um, is deviated, if there is no damage, then you cannot claim medical negligence. There has to be damage. Harm, damage means harm to the patient. Harm can be physical harm, harm can be psychological harm hmm, to the patient. Now, in this instance, that was also there. Uh, because the patient died. So there was damage also because the patient died. So that was the harm, harm to the child. Hmm? The child died. So all three Ds were there. And coming on to the fourth D, the damage or the harm has to be due to a direct consequence, direct consequence of the deviation from the expected standard of care. So the harm has to be a direct consequence of the deviation of care from the therapist. Now, when this was argued, there was a problem in this child because the child died of a brain cancer which was in the brain stem which was a very rare cancer and even if the case was diagnosed in Sri Lanka the child, early the child would have died because there is no treatment available. Even in London, it was not available at that particular time. It depends on the time also. Right? So, the death was actually not due to the direct results of not diagnosing the illness. Death occurred because the nature of the illness was such that it, death was inevitable. So, death, the harm was not a direct result of the deviation from the expected standard. The expected standard was the professor should have done a brain scan, which he did not do, which was available at the LRH at that time, but it was not done. So, there was a definite deviation in the standard of care. But the Supreme Court made the decision the death was actually not due to the direct result of not diagnosing the illness. The death would have anyway happened even if you had diagnosed the, the condition on the first day itself because there is no treatment. So this is something important for all therapists to remember that when you are dealing with patients or clients, Ensure that these four Ds are looked after. That's very, very important. Okay, I will stop there. Pradeep? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, nearly 40 people in the uh, group. So if you have questions to Dr. Nilfernand, you can ask. Uh, regarding this uh, ethics and uh, legal background of mental health care. Uh, you can ask in the chat box so you can uh, raise your hand and so that we can... Uh, uh, I have to look at the chat box, is it? Uh, yeah. No, sir, I will read. Uh, if you can read, that will be better. Yeah. Uh,
yeah okay and also uh if you didn't uh, get the meeting link like uh, we we uh, sent already i think sorry yes, already yes. i think there are some questions in the chat box uh no sir no questions there yeah, just no, one, uh, messages. Uh, one on compulsory, compulsory treatment ah yes compulsory yes. treatment what yeah, about, what about uh, i will read the thing what about yeah can you read the question uh, okay so i will read so that i will answer. i will read uh, what about yes. in case of domestic violence isn't the couple counseling compulsory as per the prevention uh, prevention of domestic violence act yes now whatever the whatever the whatever the condition compulsory treatment can only be given if there is a mental disorder domestic violence can be due to a mental disorder like morbid jealousy or what we call delusions of infidelity uh, in that case yes compulsory treatment can be used but sometimes domestic violence may take place without a mental disorder i am talking a mental disorder there can be mental health issues but mental disorder there you cannot uh, use uh, compulsory treatment right but uh, now sometimes there are situations where uh, if it is referred to the courts the courts will then make a order uh, for the couple to go for treatment so in that case they follow the court order and they come for treatment so sometimes we see that uh, couples are referred through courts now the purpose of referring is to actually try to help the couple regarding the any issues that they have right so sometimes the the couple may be referred to the counselor attached to the courts now you know in courts there are counselors attached to the courts so they may get referrals from the courts now when that happens they the couple will come as a result of the order given by the courts otherwise uh, compulsory treatment can only be given if there is if there is a mental illness which incapacitate the person to give the consent because the nature of the illness is such that the person has no insight what we call insight no awareness about his or her illness uh, so another question there's another question is there a provision yes. for admitting suicidal clients who may not qualify for a mental health diagnosis for compulsory yes health. no yes suicidal patients yes why because suicidal patients uh, uh, if all other options are not available for example if there is no one to support the person or if the relatives are unable to look after the person right or if the person has attempted a serious suicidal attempt and has been rescued in the last moment uh, in that situation you can admit the patient because you can justify that admission because you have uh, you are going to save the life of the person and at that particular moment the person intention is to harm himself or herself uh, and you are trying to prevent that so admission itself will be a preventive measure uh, so there is a provision there for acutely suicidal patients to be admitted now usually we in the compal in in our our system in our country the law is that two doctors have to certify so the admitting doctor as well as the ward doctor 
has to certify that this person needs admission. And uh, so once that is there, two doctors certify the patient can be admitted for treatment. Yes. Uh, sir, Ms. Lasanti Daskon has, has a question. Ms. Lasanti is Thank up you. to you. Yeah. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, so my, uh, thank you, sir. It was a very interesting presentation uh, and I, uh, very informative and we learned a lot. So my question is on, uh, because see, we talk about um, uh, mental health as part of the disability in the disability realm as part of, uh, because that is also considered uh, psychosocial disabilities falls under uh, the disabilities we talk about. And one of the things that is highly contested is this very issue of mental capacity um, and the capacity to make decisions. So one of the things that we are fighting for is also to revise the laws that, that um, refer to the capacity, mental capacity of people and the stripping of rights based on this. So when it comes to the consent in that case, sir, sir because you also mentioned people who um, live with uh, learning disabilities. Uh, so the standard that we have uh, we have learned under the rights framework is that that the information needs to be given to them in formats that are accessible to them, meaning that this information needs to be given to them in simplified language, explained to them in detail or via a person who is able to interpret it. So is this something that is practiced here in Sri Lanka or is this something that we need to uh, look at in terms of codes of practice and also the law, sir. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that interesting question and a important question. Now, I agree with you that we need to reform our laws and actually we need to have a new law coming dealing with uh, mental capacity. That is something that is, uh, that is needed. A good example is if you follow the UK, uh, mental capacity law, I think it was uh, formulated in something somewhere around 2007. If you can see, there are a lot of things that we can actually learn from that. So there is a need for a new, uh, what we call mental capacity law or audience or whatever. Now, according to the existing law, what we are looking at is now what you actually highlighted was this what we call this learning disability actually the correct word now is actually intellectual disability these words also keeps changing from time to time now we call it intellectual disability that is the word that is used in the dsm5 uh, classification also so we will use that word rather than learning disability intellectual disability that is if a if a person's intellectual capacity is lost for whatever reason maybe from birth maybe after birth maybe due to an illness maybe due to an injury whatever the thing if the intellectual capacity is not there for the person to make decisions uh, about himself or herself then that is where someone else has to be responsible. So that is where the act comes to help. So you have to then act on the best interest of the person because the person himself does not have the capacity to make the correct decision due to the intellectual disability. So there should be someone else. Um, they are to actually come on behalf of the person. So that is where this, uh, uh, the, the, the issue about the capacity comes in. So uh, society has to safeguard those patients or those clients. Uh, otherwise, sometimes things can happen. For example, exploitation can take place, right? Even the family members may try to 
take undue advantage and exploitation when it comes to property and things like that. So uh, that is where this capacity, new capacity act is a is a is a is a actually a very important need now. So we need to update our uh, capacity. We need to actually have a new uh, capacity, mental capacity, incapacity act, uh, which will incorporate what all what you said, because otherwise uh, people say um, people will be at a disadvantage if they have an intellectual incapacity. Now, when I say intellectual incapacity, it doesn't mean that everyone having some incapacity uh, will fall into this category. Now, sometimes you may have an intellectual incapacity, but still able to understand and be able to make a decision. In that case, the person, though they have an intellectual incapacity, they are still capable of uh, making uh, a decision. So you have to, as you said, you have to uh, help them to uh, realize and make a decision. Wherever possible, if they can make a decision, that is good. If that is not possible, then you must have some safeguards to prevent them being exploited. Uh, so there are a few more questions. One is uh, considering the consultation of therapist. There is no standard for consultation fees. It depends on the relevant channeling center. How we can address through the ethical point of view? Yes. So now, uh, if you say there is no channeling fee, I think that is also not correct. When it comes to uh, the health department, health department, that is those doctors who comes under the health department, they have they have a uh, they have a consultation fee that has been given not to exceed that fee. So there is a fee, right? Uh, but whether consultants adhere to this is something that is uh, that is questionable, right? So, but there is a fee. So the health department had looked into that. And so uh, the other thing is, of course, reasonable fee. So what is reasonable? Again, it is very vague. What is reasonable to me may not be reasonable to you. So that is why there should be some limit. So actually, during the previous government, the previous health minister actually looked into this issue and uh, made certain uh, limits where uh, a hospital can charge uh, with regard to consultations also regarding certain surgeries and certain uh, uh, tests and things like that so there is a there is a ceiling on that but whether it is been adhered or not is a another thing okay uh, so Sarah, this is this is, uh, this is governing for government sector huh? yes okay. so sarasi has a question sarasi mahavela so sarasi your question please yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a, yeah, I have a client. She is uh, nineteen years old, mm -hmm. and uh, she some uh, most of the time she done unwanted things. So I have to inform uh, her parents. But uh, she is nineteen years old, and she is the elder. She is uh, elderly one. But uh, in that time, she is uh, she is uh, she is doing something childish. Uh, she has a childish activity. Childish so, behavior. Yeah, sorry, childish yeah. behavior. And okay. uh, in that in that case, uh, yes. do I uh, do I inform her parents yes. it is now, legal yeah, yeah. or not? Yeah. Now again, now these are now when the law says eighteen, yeah. whether it is a one day short of eighteen or one day more than eighteen. Hmm? Yes. I mean these are laws, but when it when it be when it, when it is being applied you have to also look at in the best interest of the patient now sometimes the person may be over the age of 18 but still maybe the intellectual development or intellectual capacity may not be developed uh, 
to a person of an adult. So that is something that you need to look at. So I think uh, if this, uh, my, uh, my advice to you is first to assess the person's uh, intellectual capacity, right? And see whether there, is, whether there is any intellectual disability taking place, even a mild intellectual disability taking place. Then the person will qualify for uh, parental right. But if that is also done, and if the intellectual levels are also not very clear in the sense it is marginal, uh, probably you can act in the best interest of the patient. So if the best interest of the patient is to inform the parents because probably the person is still being looked after by the parents, there is no harm. You have not done something harmful because you have acted in the best interest of the patient. So you have informed the parents uh, because there is a need for preventing such uh, harm in the future. Now you said unwanted things happening, behaviors which are not appropriate for the age. So these things can happen in the future also. Now in order to prevent that, uh, inform because the parents are the ones who are still looking after the patient. So that's okay. So these are guidelines, right? They are not absolute uh, rules. These are guidelines for us to follow. But the best guideline would be to act on the best interest of the patient or the client. So uh, you you are you can actually go ahead and do what you think is the best for the patient. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so another question: Is it ethically accepted to conduct mobile interviews through Zoom over the phone uh, for a research study with patients with mental impairments? What are the potential harms and how to mitigate it? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, these are things now, times are changing now, so we are now learning now, even having Zoom discussions about these things we did not do no earlier. Hmm? So things, yeah, you can change things. I mean, you need not to follow everything. So you can do research also, yes, provided you, of course, adhere to the scientific merits. So that is why a research, uh, before doing a research, you have to submit your protocol uh, which will include the method of conducting the research to a research ethical clearance committee. Uh, so they will look at, they will see whether the research principles are adhered to and there is no harm done to a participant uh, and also about the, uh, the, the confidentiality of the information. Those All those things have to be looked into. And then the ethical committee will decide whether that is uh, a research that can be conducted uh, or whether it is ethically sound or not. So it is up to the ethical committee to decide. But uh, certainly you can, and I know research are being conducted uh, because earlier we used to do research through post. No? We used to send letters and get a reply. So that was also a form of a research from a, what we call distance research. So similarly, you can also use your uh, electronic media uh, or social media uh, to do research. Uh, that There is no problem about using those things, but the principles have to be adhered to. So that is why your ethical, uh, what you call a uh, ethical committee, no, they call it ethical. Yes, ethical clearance committee. Ethical, ethical clearance committee. Ethical, review, ethical committee. review. Yes, yes. Ethical review committee is there. So you need to get because no, no, no publication. You may not be able to publish your research in any any recognized journal without an ethical clearance uh, certificate because research will not be accepted. So that is standard practice now. So if you if a, your research is not being published in any uh, acceptable thing, then there is no point in doing a research also because you will not get recognized for that. So, uh, so that is why, so you need to actually uh, give the, all the methods, uh, your protocol should have the research design and the methodology clearly spelled out and they will look into this ethical side because that is their uh, job to do that and then they will advise you 
whether it is sound or if it is not sound, how can it be made to a ethically sound uh, research? But the method uh, you can use, I think there is no barrier there. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, I think we are now going, uh, coming to the end, but we have two questions. Both questions are related to sexual abuse victims. So I will ask both questions together so that you can answer uh, to the both questions. First one is a psychiatric patient find out sexual abused and got pregnant frequently, one child with unknown father. It may be done her alcohol brother or not. As a healthcare worker attaching with the Ministry of Health, uh, how can we make actions without any legal corruption? Shall we make arrangements for any family planning without her concern, such as patients unknown about it? First question. The second one is... Uh, there seems to be a discourse that perpetrators of sexual and gender-based violence are mentally incapacitated. How could this be addressed or is this currently addressed in the mental health discourse in Sri Lanka? If yes, are there any material to refer because this helps people and organizations working with survivors of sexual and gender-based violence and or engaging with perpetrators? Right. Uh, first thing is actually about... Uh... Uh, doing any contraceptive or family planning things, you have to be with the consent of the person. Uh, unless the person is uh, intellectually disabled to the extent that they cannot give the consent, then you can actually, uh, in good faith, you may be able to uh, do certain things. But again, the best thing is not to just go by one person, the idea is actually to be seen by uh, two consultants, uh, independent consultants um, deciding on that so that it is not based on one person's uh, opinion alone. Um, otherwise, if the person is capable of giving the consent, then it has to be always with the consent. So, uh, patient education then would be the most important thing. Um, and of course, if there is any underlying treat, uh, medical condition, especially sometimes there are certain illnesses where the sexual libido is increased and that can lead to uh, uh, frequent sexual relationships due to the illness. Now, one such illness is mania. And uh, now I have experience where patient, uh, two of them, uh, there were two patients in my ward. Uh, both are un both were unmarried uh, uh, young mm. girls who have got pregnant because of multiple sexual relationships, and they don't even know from whom they got pregnant. Now that is due to an illness. So if there is an illness, underlying illness, that needs to be treated. Um, uh, so that is the answer for that. But you cannot um, forcefully. Uh, engage in uh, uh, contraceptive methods, temporary or permanent, without the consent. That is illegal. Then the second one is about domestic uh, gender-based violence. Uh, now, uh, uh, there, there is a gender-based violence unit at NIMH. Uh, that is one place where patients can be referred to or actually there is a there is a hotline available uh, 1926 1926 where toll free hotline available 24 hours in all three languages where this can be reported and uh, advice taken um, then about the other thing about uh, uh, the other issue what are the last issue uh, in the second question, there was a. Uh, so it is. Uh, are there any? If yours, are there any material? No, there have a gender identity issue was also there. Was it that was asked? Yes. No, sir. No? It's asking. Uh, are there any material to refer? For as as they are working with the victims, are there any material? They, Mr. Tilena, can you can you ask this question? Ask your question, please. Material yes. means we are what? Now, we have what we call victim support system. Uh, we have authority to support victims. 
of criminal uh, criminal uh, what do you call uh, victims of criminal uh, behavior um, that is the victim has certain uh, rights to actually for compensation and things like that so there is an authority for that is called the national authority for protection of uh, victims and witnesses uh, following criminal behavior uh, so that is something that you can actually look for because it is available free of charge uh, but i agree that you need to have more material about victims not only about sexual victims but about all victims so victimology is a subject that is still not very uh, well uh, addressed in sri lanka and there are ne needs to be more studies and awareness programs being done so that is uh, something that is lacking at the moment okay we talk a lot of about uh, accused people the perpetrators there are a lot of literature but very few literature in sri lanka about victims uh, yeah thank you sir um I just wanted to ask something also maybe my question is also not clear um i think there seems to be a discourse in the society that perpetrators of gbv are mentally incapacitated because there seems to be like a justifying uh, you know that uh, it's I okay to, to, because yeah, they right. yeah, I, I, so, yeah i understand what your problem yeah actually they are not mentally there can be mental health issues mental health issues and mental illness are two different things right so they may need some other but that does not mean that they cannot they can, they they are not responsible for what they have been done but yeah. they may need some help uh they may also need some help and we know that most of these abusers are victims of abuse in uh, earlier so that is also the the abuser becomes the abuse becomes the abuser that is also well known in this area so so they may need some help professional help in order to get over their behavior right that should be the way that we have to look at it okay uh, sir. sir are there any research or material to refer to uh, on this like uh, perpetrators being victims of uh, abuse yeah there is there is a lot of uh, literature available probably if you go to a uh, um, um, research uh, 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 paper uh, uh, catalog you will find lot of research done on that area yes thank you sir uh, okay sir uh, one last question uh, it is about uh, age 18 and 23 years old two young girls addicted to homosexuality yeah, we need to counsel both of single partner to sort out this problem <laughs> very interesting now uh, at the onset i have to say that homosexuality is not a illness right uh, it is a natural variation that is what we normally accept right so but people who indulge in that uh, uh, it's actually a sexual preference right and they may encounter certain difficulties as a result of uh, their behavior they may encounter so they may need some psychological help in that way but otherwise their behavior is not taken as something uh, ill and i think there is some wrong information going in sri lanka by some people uh, um, saying that this is a illness which is wrong it is not a illness it is a natural variation right uh, Uh, it's a it's a form of sexual preference uh, so unless if they need some psychological help individually we should not interfere with that that is my view actually